Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring out-of-body experiences. With me is Luis Minero, who is the president of the International Academy of Consciousness, an international organization with offices around the world and headquarters in Portugal. Luis is also the director of the California office of that organization, and he is author of a book called Demystifying the Out-of-Body experience. Welcome, Luis. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you. Now, I understand that before you ever became involved with the International Academy of Consciousness or even read any books about out-of-body experiences, you began as a, as a teenager having them spontaneously. I, indeed, indeed. For me, they began uh, involuntary, spontaneously. When I was about 12 years old, I had my first out-of-body experience, and at that time I didn't know if there was a name for them, if there were techniques, uh, how to induce them. I just simply had them, but they were mm -hmm. very clear. I was very, very aware, very clear-minded at the moment that I was having them. So I realized that that was something different from a dream. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so you were, in effect, in bed asleep when they occurred. I was. Uh, actually, the first one, I was uh, taking a nap in the, the middle of the afternoon when it happened. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it's interesting. It seems that napping seems to facilitate. <laughs> yes, indeed, <laughs> indeed. Uh, I, I don't know when it had happened that day, but probably, you know, at that age, I had been playing soccer or baseball or something, and you come, you come home, you take a nap. And uh, the next thing I remember is I was, uh, actually this happened because I was uh, fooling around with a little computer in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I took a nap, and the next thing I remember, I was already, you know, with my hand sort of like in the keyboard and thinking about the program that I wanted to design. But I remembered, didn't I go to sleep? And then the moment that I turned around, I saw my bed on the physical, I, I saw my body on the physical bed. And then, of course, this prompted me to go back to the physical body very quickly. But I was mm -hmm. very aware, and it wasn't surprising or scary. It was just simply, you know, took me, I, I wasn't expecting it. Well, this seems to be one of the primary characteristics is being able to look and see your body. I, indeed, indeed. That certainly is a very big confirmation for people, of course, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it happens quite often. And the implication is that somehow you've got a set of eyes outside of your body. E exactly. You have the ability to perceive from a different vantage point. And in this specific uh, experience, even on the first one, I was able to see my astral body because I remember my hands on top of the keyboard. And as I was thinking about the program that I was going to design, I could see my, my astral body. Of now, course. Uh, the astral body is a term that comes from the occult literature, yes. mystical literature. I know it was popularized a great deal by the Theosophical yes. Society. Okay. Uh, your organization, a as I understand it, has uh, endeavored, uh, I think according to the, the person who founded this tradition, Dr. Waldo Vieira of, of Brazil, he's developed a whole new vocabulary. He's <laughs> taken all of these terms and tried to put them into a, a more scientific language. And trying to update, even us, you know, certainly, you know, he was uh, the founder and everything, and we have tried as well to update, mm -hmm. you know, the things that he considered, you know, to be the most appropriate back then. So, yes, now the term that we use is, for example, psychosoma. But I, many times, you know, especially on the interviews, I use the term astral body because I know that it's the one that people have heard of the most. But astral body uh, or psychosoma. Or psychosoma, and of course, there are so many others, right? The emotional yeah. body, body of the wishes, body of desires, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Well, one of the things that uh, you've done in your research is, is, is looked at the literature on out-of-body experiences, and you've found descriptions of it in virtually every culture. 
basically all cultures, even there is a sociological paper uh, that described that 83% of the cultures that people had, uh, that this, this individual had studied, they already had names for the astral body. So it, it shows how, uh, you know, different cultures knew about it, had techniques in some cases on how to induce the out-of-body experience. Mm -hmm. Well, there are many experiences that seem similar but different. For example, lucid dreaming. Yes. Yes, indeed. And uh, in a lucid dream, of course, you can be very aware, very, very uh, sharp, uh, conscious. The difference between lucid dream and the out-of-body experience is that when you are having a lucid dream, basically everything that you're observing is something that you are producing and that you control. So, for example, we can be here in the studio, you know, or we can be having a lucid dream that we're here in the studio. And if we decide that we want for the studio to disappear and Hawaii to appear, mm -hmm. you know, we just wish it and Hawaii appears. Mm -hmm. But in the out of party experience, you can certainly go to Hawaii, but the studio is still there. It doesn't disappear. So it's almost as if the reality outside the body is independent of you. Okay. That's a, a crucial difference. Yes. When you're having an out-of-body experience, you seem to be moving through what we call the physical world. The physical world, or even when you are in other dimensions, they seem to be more independent of you, to a certain extent more objective. And then you cannot just simply change them at will like mm -hmm. you can in a lucid dream. Oh, okay. Um, now, there are other experiences that are similar to an out-of-body experience. A, a common term is astral projection. Yes, yes. And these sometimes, uh, the difference between astral projection or out-of-body experience, I know that many authors sometimes, what they do is, depending on the place where you are, going to when you're having an out-of-body experience, so what they call the astral planes or the higher planes, mm -hmm. then they call it more the astral travel or the astral projection yeah. or the out-of-body experience. Uh, in essence, so they have these classifications, mm -hmm. but in essence, you know, they all imply you disconnecting from your body, going in this other vehicle, mm -hmm. you know, uh, to different realities and to different dimensions. O okay, not necessarily associated with the physical plane. Not necessarily associated with the physical plane, exactly. Those, those other ones, I would say, are the exploration of what people call the spiritual planes or alternative planes of existence, mm -hmm. etc. Et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But the classic out-of-body experience, you have the option to go into those planes, but you can also just explore physical reality. Indeed, indeed. You can certainly stay within the physical reality. You can observe things in the physical reality, and this is interesting, especially for people at the beginning, because at the beginning they are looking for the element of confirmation. Am I, a, am I actually having a real experience beyond my physical body, and can mm -hmm. I confirm it somehow? Yeah, because there's always the possibility of fantasy. The, of course, there's always that possibility. Naturally, what happens as you keep on having more out-of-party experiences is that you realize that you are so conscious, so aware, that you really after a while you don't confuse them anymore with, uh, let's say, a dream or even a lucid dream. To a certain extent, it's very similar, Jeffrey, to what's happening to us right now, or you know, people who are watching this mm -hmm. this interview. That if I, I sometimes sort of joke with this, and I say, if at this moment that you're watching this interview, are you dreaming about it, or are you aware or awake, you know, that you are seeing it? And of course, everybody knows they are aware. That nobody's pinching themselves, mm -hmm. and uh, so and that uh, certainty comes from the internal level of awareness that a person is enjoying. Mm -hmm. So when you are outside the body, you get used to the also that internal level of awareness, that sharpness of mind, your internal logic, processing, memory, and then you realize I am in an out of party experience. It's very different really from the lucid dream or mm -hmm. the dreams. Now another very similar experience is remote viewing where yes. people are able to well, without any sensation of yes. leaving their body, acquire information from uh, elsewhere in the physical world, uh, elsewhere in space, even in time. Yes, yes indeed. And, uh, and in essence it is because many times they haven't really left uh, the body. It's just simply the displacement of a sense, mm -hmm. in this case of the vision most of the times, but not only. Sometimes, you know, the when they are 
perceiving something remotely is not only the visual input, but also sometimes they get a sensorial input and auditory input, et cetera. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Something that is interesting to, to say between the out-of-party experience and that, and the, for example, remote viewing is when you are outside the body, part of the characteristics or the abilities of the, again, astral body are very similar to the remote viewing condition, mm -hmm. meaning when you're outside the body, just like your hand can go through a wall, your vision can also go through the wall and you can be looking at what is happening on the other room, on the room next door, or you can hear what is happening, you know, uh, I don't know, a hundred yards out. Mm -hmm. So this remote sensing, in essence, seem to be the normal capacities of perception of the astral body. Mm -hmm. That while we are while we are inside the body, they are restricted, they are contained, and then we need either some training mm -hmm. or some predisposition that some individuals have, of course, to be able to use it inside the body. Mm -hmm. But outside the body, it seems to be the normal. Mm -hmm. Well, from a theoretical point of view, um, not long ago I interviewed Ed May, one of the main researchers who, who worked uh, for military intelligence for 20 years right. studying remote viewing, and he models it as uh, information is somehow coming from outside into the brain. Okay. So uh, what, what he's saying is we don't need to assume that our consciousness is operating outside the body when we do remote viewing. It's that the information is coming to us by some unidentified channel. Right. But uh, your thinking, as I understand it, is that consciousness does operate outside of the physical body, outside of the brain altogether. Yes, yes it does. And, and um, I certainly would agree with what he's saying. While you are having a remote viewing and you are inside your body, you definitely don't need to be outside the body in order for the remote viewing to happen. So that's, that's um, that explains certain cases. Mm -hmm. But when you are outside your body, you are already operating outside the limits of the brain. And you also have the ability of remote viewing while you are outside the body. So that uh, helps to explain these other cases as well. Mm -hmm. And that's also why I was mentioning the ability itself of this remote sensing seems to be more of the astral body mm -hmm. than of the physical body. Okay. That when we, when we are inside the body, we can still use that ability, but we need a little bit more of training. We need a little bit more of development. While outside the body, really, this is the normal. Mm -hmm. Even uh, individuals or students, even you know, uh, on some of the first uh, experiences, they can already use it. Well, uh, remote viewers report the same. It works very well the first time. In fact, some <laughs> some viewers never exceed their very first experience. It's right. It's right. Uh, but now. Wh when you refer to the astral body or what you called the uh, psychosoma right. earlier, you seem to be suggesting that it comes equipped with all sorts of organs of perception, much like the physical body. Yes, to a, to a certain extent. Obviously, organs in this case would be a you know, a, a loosely used term, but I, but I understand that sometimes, and sometimes this happens with the out-of-body experiences. We end up using words, mm -hmm. you know, that make sense here to describe realities that are non-physical because yeah. honestly, we don't have a better word. Mm -hmm. So we certainly have the ability to perceive the astral body per se doesn't have like organs, but um, it's still a good word to use so as to convey the idea, mm -hmm. right? So for example, we realize we don't see with the eyes of the astral body only, but you can see basically through the entire body. And then in some out of body experiences, you are experientially, you realize you are aware enough to the point to which your entire skin is perceiving. And then you are seeing 360 degrees up and down and you realize it's not necessarily, s this perception is not necessarily associated only to the eyes of the astral body, or the hearing is not only to the ears and so on and so forth, or the sensorial input as well. So um, uh, it is uh, the condition when we are outside the body is a lot richer in terms of the perception. Mm -hmm. Now your organization actually trains people to 
produce out-of-body experiences at will rather than only when they should happen spontaneously. Exactly. That, that is the idea because we observe that it is basically a skill, you know, like any other skill that we might have developed. It's a matter of receiving some information, dedicating some time, and the ability goes on developing little by little. And we even have several activities where not only are they research activities to try to provide conventional data on, confirm on confirming the out-of-body experiences, but also in trying to understand this aspect that we are uh, discussing here of how does the, per the non-physical perception work, mm -hmm. especially when you're trying to perceive something that is physical or you know made for the physical reality. So mm -hmm. we, we have a lot of those types of experiments, mm -hmm. so to speak. And I know you're working with scientists, you sponsor scientific conferences, yes. you have had hundreds of people go through your programs all around the world. You're collecting their experiences. You must have a large database. Yes, yes, of, indeed. Uh, what the, of people's personal subjective reports of out-of-body travel? Exactly, and also of what works and what doesn't work and what is easier, you know, in order to develop the skill. For example, uh, just mentioning a few things. Sometimes. Um, you know, there is, let's say, a technique for living the body that seems to be very effective, but we realize, or is very effective for us, but we realize that what might be very effective for us is actually very ineffective for the person next to us. Mm -hmm. So a different type of technique is needed. So usually even in the classes, the ideal is to try to, uh, for them to learn several different types of out-of-body experiences so yeah. as for the person to find out which one is the one that goes better with my personality. Mm -hmm. with how I am and yeah. that then is going to facilitate my out-of-body experiences. Mm -hmm. And you yourself w went in your own progress from spontaneous experiences to being able to generate them consciously. Yes, as well. Mm -hmm. that, that, that as well happened and of course I have my own techniques that are a little bit more, uh, that work a little bit better for me mm -hmm. as well. Uh -huh. Well, and, and I'm sure there's a lot of individual variation. There are. There are. At the end of the day, it almost seems as if, you know, you create your own that is going to work a little bit better for you. Mm -hmm. Because, well, for example, many people know of the work of Robert Monroe. Indeed, yeah. Author of Journeys Out of the Body and yeah. the Monroe Institute. I took my first classes uh, <laughs> back in the 1970s with, with the Monroe Institute. Yeah. And my understanding is uh, that in spite of their decades of experience, that full-blown out-of-body experiences are still quite rare, even uh, in, in amongst their st long-time students. Yeah, I, I cannot speak, uh, you know, uh, completely of what are their success rate. I, I know that some people have out-of-body experiences with their methods, no doubt. Yeah. Uh, I think that maybe something that also comes into play there is the fact that since there is something external inducing them in you, mm -hmm. depending, I think, that on your state of mind, on some days that works yeah. a little bit better, on other days it doesn't. Yeah. Uh, they work with uh, audio tapes. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so our, our approach is to try to help the person to develop a skill, you know, mm -hmm. self-control, and this can be based, for example, on breathing or on bre certain breathing techniques or on imagination techniques mm -hmm. or on concentration or on working with bioenergies or vital energies. So different types, mm -hmm. but that basically end up developing the skill, the control of the person without any external device, so, so to speak. So it's more like a yoga practice. More like a yoga practice, yes, along those lines, indeed. Mm -hmm. And, and of course, the uh, folklore of yoga is uh, replete with out-of-body experiences. Yes, yes. Many times when people are practicing yoga or meditation, by mm -hmm. the way, as well, they describe out-of-body experiences. They end up having out-of-body experiences, of course, even because some of the elements are the same. For example, usually you are a little bit more focused, more concentrated, more undisturbed, especially mm -hmm. when you're doing a meditation. Yeah. And that sometimes end up ends up promoting mm -hmm. the out-of-body experience. Uh, another intriguing aspect of it to me is the notion of uh, creating an apparition so that I may have an out-of-body experience and go visit you and you might see me appear uh, as an apparition. I might appear to be quite solid. Right, right. 
And, um, you know, in the classes, I don't know if I might be corrupting everybody here from the first interview, but even in the classes, something that we say to students for them to try mm -hmm. is, you know, leave your body. And then once you're outside your body, trying to make, uh, trying to densify yourself a little bit to make physical effects. So, for example, start with something small, like focus on the tip of your finger and try to feel it as heavy as you can. And that will just simply draw energy from everywhere and uh, you will concentrate it on the tip of your finger mm -hmm. and then go to the light switch on the wall and see if you're able to flip the light switch. Mm -hmm. Not the easiest out of body experience, not the easiest you know, thing to do and it yeah. probably won't happen the first time. Mm -hmm. And also I even suggest to students, don't spend all of your out of body experiences poking the wall there that there isn't a lot of evolution in that. Yeah. <laughs> but try it a few times. Mm -hmm have five years of out-of-body experiences, try it again, and then little by little, you know, uh, on some opportunities. Is this something you've done? You can flip a light switch? Have you not, ever done Not that? a light switch, no. One time, maybe about, uh, this must have been about 15 years ago or 20 years ago. Uh, it, this was about the time in which we had the desktops in our, I guess, in my bedroom running with a screensaver yeah. the entire night. I was able to move a little bit the mouse and the screensaver stopped. You know how mm -hmm. it's sometimes very sensitive yeah, and yeah. just a little bit of movement is stopped mm -hmm. and I realized it stopped. I even came back to my body to, uh -huh. to confirm that, the, uh, okay. you know, that it had already stopped. But it's certainly... Very subtle physical effect. Yes, but it's certainly, let me, let me say, not the easiest thing to do. It really requires a lot of development. It's almost like, you know, learning to run 100 meters under 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. Possible? but difficult. Yeah. <laughs> well, I and I gather that the main purpose in your organization for people to want to learn out of body experience isn't isn't to go around flipping light switches exactly. or, <laughs> or or physical effects, but there's a whole realm of uh, self-awareness associated yes. with yes. that experience. Yes, self-awareness or what people like to call personal development or inner growth because you see the benefits that come to people after they start uh, having their own out-of-body experiences. So, for example, uh, and you probably have heard this, of course, Jeffrey, is, you know, people lose the fear of death, mm -hmm. which is a very big thing. Well, that's normally associated with the near-death experience. As well. It's because, you know, in the near-death experience, th or sometimes from the optics of the out-of-body experience, you see that the near-death experience is a forced out-of-body experience. Mm -hmm. the, first one w the person wasn't trying to have it, but it was you know, forced outside but its usually body. Usually by a trauma. Exactly, mm -hmm. by a trauma, by the heart attack, by the accident, etc. Yeah. And then the effects are pretty much the same for mm -hmm. the uh, personal development, um, mm -hmm. you know, of the person. So they lose the fear of death, they become more humane. They also usually get a glimpse of what is the, what people like to call the life task or the life, life purpose. The life purpose, yes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So many individuals, they come back and they have a greater sense of direction of, you know, I wanted to accomplish this with my, my physical life, right? Mm -hmm. They uh, also do it because they want to contact deceased relatives. Mm -hmm. They want to contact their this figure, the spirit guide or, you know, the master, the illuminated being, which you realize that in out-of-body experiences, that is feasible. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a whole philosophy associated with the notion that consciousness is independent of the brain, independent of the physical body. That opens you up to the world of uh, spiritual guides and helpers and right. uh, reincarnation and uh, understanding right. uh, post-mortem survival and yes. and the idea of a life purpose begins to uh, become part of a, a whole larger metaphysical understanding. Yes, and, and you know, and, and part of what we would say is certainly there is that, that theory, but the out-of-body experience in a very experiential fashion can help you to go from the theory to jump into the direct observation, into mm -hmm. the practice, so that it doesn't have to be just, let's say, let's call it a belief, mm -hmm. or just simply something that makes sense in our mind, but something that I actually already observed. So more or less like saying, you know, my hand is something that I experience it, and I don't need to believe in it, but for me it's a certainty mm -hmm. that I have it. So more or less along the same lines. Mm -hmm. 
Well, th well that's quite powerful. It right? is. I, I agree. Yes. Very, very powerful. And that is the reason why sometimes, you know, conventional science, which mm -hmm. has excellent models, I think, uh, you know, of uh, progress, at the same time, because it is so powerful, it takes a little bit longer, you know, to... Mm -hmm. Uh, I guess dedicate resources, <laughs> you know, towards that uh, idea. Well, we live in a modern culture, materialistic culture, in which the very notion, ev everything that you're talking about, might well be considered a symptom of psychosis. Yes, yes, I, I, I can, I can see that perspective. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, I, I would say I disagree with it, but I can certainly understand where they're coming from. Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, at one time, a person reporting the sorts of things that you have uh, been discussing with me would be considered uh, a candidate for uh, incarceration in a mental hospital yes, or indeed. a shaman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and all kinds of uh, strange experiments being done on them, right? Yeah. Uh, I agree, I agree. This is even part of the reason why it's good for this information to go out so yeah. that for people to realize that even if they are having these types of experiences, it doesn't mean that there is something wrong with them or that there is some mm -hmm. pathological, yeah. you know, uh, cause for that, but no, not at all. Uh. I do. I did interview Lauren Belge, a medical doctor, who yeah. talked about people having out-of-body experiences in the hospital, and and the medical staff just didn't know how to uh, discuss it. They just tried to hush it up, act as if it didn't happen. Exactly how, and, and I can see that it must be very hard for them coming from a conventional background. Uh, to try to interpret it, to try to give them guidance. Uh, it, it, this is information that unfortunately is, it's a gap that unfortunately is missing. Yeah, that's why I think the, the work of your organization and of course the hundreds of books that have been written on yes. this subject are, yes. are, are important. This is a, a whole area of human experience that gets suppressed. Indeed, and you know, because uh, spontaneously and involuntarily it happens so infrequently, and sometimes there isn't enough information on how to actually induce it, yeah. uh, it, o it has always stayed sort of like a, a, um, a skill of the minority of the minority, right? Mm -hmm. And this is to a certain extent something that we're trying to, to change, at least to, to bring light, you know, to this aspect of human potential, of human abilities. Luis Minero, this has been a delightful discussion and I commend you on the good work that you're doing. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you so much for being with me. My pleasure. And thank you for being with us.